you have a copy of God's Word, I'm going to invite you uh, to turn together with me uh, to the book of Ephesians as we continue our time together in Ephesians in chapter 5. Ephesians in chapter 5. We're going to pick up our reading at verse 15 together. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. The Bible reads, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for this is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit addressing one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Today what I want to do is I want to talk to us about what it means to be a spirit-filled Christian. I want to take some time together with you and highlight for us, together from God's Word, the spirit-filled life. Uh, you cannot live the Christian life apart from understanding the importance of being a spirit-filled Christian. Here, the Apostle Paul finally takes the time to be able to highlight for us uh, the believer who is filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, additionally, what I'd like to do is take some of the mystery out of what it means to be a Spirit-filled believer. And what I see here, and what we'll have an opportunity to see together in this particular section of Scripture, is that Paul leaves with us and lays forth for us the marks of a spirit-filled Christian. One of the first marks that we see of a spirit-filled Christian is a guarded life. A guarded life. And we see that in verse 15. Paul opens up there in the text, look carefully then how you walk, not as foolish or as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of of the time because the days are evil. If you were like me, if you could look back before you and I were believers or cared at all about what it meant to be a Christian or what it looked like to please the Lord, we just lived any old way. I didn't give necessarily any particular thought or consideration as to one, my choices, and number two, the consequences of my choices. We just got up and we lived and we did our thing and we just let the chips fall wherever they may. The moment that we became Christians, all of that changed. You see, one of the marks of a spirit-filled Christian is one who pays careful attention to how they live their lives. So this is the first way that we're going to take the mystery out of what it means to be a spirit-filled Christian. Someone who is filled with the Holy Spirit, who lives a life that aims to keep in step with the Holy Spirit, is someone who, for the first time, begins to set out to be mindful of the life that they're actually living, right? Before the Holy Spirit is in us, we just live any old way. We may look to the person to the left or to the right, or we may just look to the world itself and see, what is everybody else doing? It seems like everybody else is doing that, so I might as well join in. It doesn't make sense to go on to continue to live that way the moment that we not only become Christians, but the moment that we understand what it means to be a spirit-filled Christian, right? So more than just warm fuzzies, what the Holy Spirit does, his presence and his power is he causes us 
to give careful attention to our lives and how we lead them. Here, Paul says, be careful, look carefully then how you walk. The word there, walk is a metaphor, conduct, lifestyle, way of life. Look carefully. In other words, take consideration with the choices that you're making with your life. Don't just simply live any old way and then try to figure out later on, or later on whether or not that was the right thing or the wrong thing. Well before you make any decision, weigh those decisions of yours. That's what the Holy Spirit helps us to do. He helps us to look carefully how we lead our lives in every aspect of our lives. In fact, he says, not as foolish, but as wise. One of the things that marks our non-Christian life is foolishness, right? There was a lot of foolishness that went on there. The book of Proverbs constantly juxtaposes, sets side by side, the wise person against the foolish person. Uh, a wise person is, is someone who, wisdom is not just knowledge, wisdom is knowledge applied. Uh, in our time and in our day, there's a glut of information. If you got YouTube, if you got Google, if you got ChatGPT, nobody has any problem acquiring a lot of information. That's not our problem. What we have a problem with today is wisdom. Wisdom. Because you could have Google and you could have YouTube, that doesn't necessarily mean you and I have wisdom. It doesn't necessarily mean you and I are wise. God wants us to be wise people. The book of Proverbs says, in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom. And here, wisdom is shown in relationship to being, looking carefully how we walk. Does this please the Lord? Is this something that is honoring to the Lord? Is this consistent with what it looks like and what it means to be a Christian? That's that's a wise person. That's a spirit-filled Christian. So the first thing that we see there is to be spirit-filled, one of the marks of a spirit-filled believer is someone who pays careful attention to their life. And not just their life, but the choices that come forth from their life. Right? Right? Christians should be very intentionally living Christians. We shouldn't live the Christian life by accident. We should live the Christian life intentionally, intentionally. This is the beautiful thing about, the, about being a Christian is the moment you become one, every aspect of your life has meaning. I, I used to always just blow my mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, Paul would say, whatever you do, do all to the glory of who? Of God, even down to eating and drinking. What? What does toast and orange juice in the morning have anything to do with glorifying the Lord? That's what Christianity does. We don't have to wait for conferences. We don't have to wait for some big moment. I sure hope I show up for the Lord in that. No, no, no. How about Monday at 9 a.m.? How about lunch break? How about the evening? How about, it doesn't matter what the thing is. It's the fact that I now belong to him that gives everything in my life value and import and meaning. So as Christians, we don't have to wait for it to matter to any particular person or to the world. We want to take every aspect of our life, big or small, and look carefully, look carefully how we walk, how we live. So the first mark that we see there is a guarded life. But the second mark that we see is a productive life. Look with me at verse 16. A spirit-filled Christian is a productive Christian. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. I know there's a lot of talk out there in the world outside of the church about time management. And you got your time management gurus. And there's a lot of talk about productivity. But well before anybody else was talking about productivity and time management, God was talking about productivity and time management. Notice, the Bible says there, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We just don't have all the time in the world. Time is short. 
And one thing that we could use now more than ever is a sense of urgency that comes to the church. And here's something that Paul brings up. He calls the days evil. This is a time where judges all over again is on repeat. And one of the mottos that repeated itself in the book of Judges was, it was a time in which everyone did that which was right in his own eyes or in his own mind. And Paul is looking at the landscape. Paul is looking at Ephesus. He's looking at these new believers, and he's, he realizes, boy, I tell you, y'all need prayer. Because when I look around your context and I see your culture, those days are evil. And it almost causes someone to just simply go with the flow, kind of like our days. And this is a time in which there was no fear of God in the people's hearts. And Paul says, that should not be so among yourselves. Rather, he says, you should be, of all people, if you're filled with God's Holy Spirit, you should be people who are making the best use of not just time, that time. In other words, did you know that there are things that God would have you to do before you leave this earth. How would your life li be changed? How would your life be lived any differently if you just took that away today? That there's a certain amount of things that not her, not him, you are assigned and called by God to do before you leave this earth. That's how Jesus lived. When he came on this earth, he didn't waste time. He came in a time where there was evil all around him, but he made the best use of the time. Everybody tried to pull him in one direction or another, his mom, his brothers, the crowds, the religious leaders, but he was always focused on what it was that his father would have him to do. He made the best use, he redeemed the time. He redeemed the time knowing that these days are evil. This sort of evil is shown in all sorts of ways. We see it in schools, in curriculum. We see it in culture, in social media. We see it with uh, some of the ways in which pressure is put upon uh, believers for today. We see evil by some of the things that are celebrated and applauded and held up in esteem in our day and age. We see evil showing up in different forms and different shapes. It's the days of evil. Now, it could safely be said ever since Genesis chapter 3, it's always been evil. Because evil entered into the picture, at least humanly speaking, not with angelic beings, but humanly speaking, it entered since Genesis chapter 3. But there's a sense in which these are the last days. And if these are the last days, evil, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, that not only the love of many will grow cold, but that evil will grow even more and more rampant in our times. These days are evil. Our hopes should not be set here and now. We need to believe and understand that God is restoring all things, that Jesus is making all things new, and that we get a chance to begin to see glimpses and, and traces of this. That's why the kingdom is an already and a not yet kingdom. That's why we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come on earth as it already is in heaven. It, it is totally there. It's not totally here. It's gradually here. And until then, one of the ways that we contribute toward making it here is by making the best use of the time. You and I are called the salt and the light of the earth. And the way that we show up as the salt and the light of the earth is by making the best use of the time. H how can we redeem time in our day and age? One is, if there's any group of people that should not be confused about their identity, it's believers. If there's any group of people that should be people of purpose, it should be Christians. If there's any group of people that should understand the importance that we want to leave the world better off than we found it, it should be the believers. 
we should be ones who are not adding to the problem, but we should be contributing toward the solution. And so as Christians, we are called to make the best use of the time. So we can look at our days. We could look at our hours. How are we spending our time? How are we taking our time and our talent and our, and our treasure and leveraging it in a way for kingdom purposes? You see, this is what a spirit-filled believer does. They take the, the time that they have and they redeem it because they realize not only do we not have all the time in the world, the days that we live in are evil. You see, um, there was someone who, Aaron Wren, who came up with this idea. I think we brought it up before. The idea of the positive world, neutral world, negative world. He wrote a book, Life in a Negative World. And one of the things he talked about was before 1994, um, America largely in the West was a positive world. In other words, it was in our interest to come out as Christian. You didn't stay in the closet about that. Uh, in fact, you probably would want to add that on your resume. Um, in a conversation, at a cocktail party or whatever, you probably want to find a way and a time to throw it in there because it'll help you. Because to be a Christian, to know, oh, I go to that church, oh, that's your pastor, or oh, you're a part of that community, that actually gave you a foot in the door regardless of what the situation was. It was a positive world. In other words, you are incentivized to go public as a Christian. That time has passed. After 1994, we quickly shifted into a neutral world where this is the times where in the 1980s and 1990s and so forth where all of a sudden the seeker-sensitive movement took place, right? And this was a time in which where it wasn't necessarily that people were sold on the idea of being Christians, but society came to the place where they were like, okay, you do you and we'll do ourselves. And so I respect the fact that you're a Christian, but just respect the fact that I'm not a Christian yet. And so there's a sense in which we tolerated each other, neutral world. And so we'd pull out of our driveway on Sunday and they'd probably just be watering their grass or going golfing and we'd go to church and we just kind of coexisted with each other. That was neutral world. But then once 2014 came, we quickly entered into a negative world. We went from positive world to neutral world to a negative world, Aaron Wren describes. And if you remember what happened in 2014, in 2014, Obergefell decision was passed. That was the time that the definition of marriage actually changed and that same-sex marriage was actually instantiated as, as law. It wasn't just something that individuals took upon themselves and viewed themselves as, it was actually instantiated. In other words, the federal government got involved. This was unprecedented. And what that did was it created a shift in our society and in our culture where a lot of things came after that. We entered into a negative world and quickly and immediately, and I remember that around that time, every church had to quickly come up with a statement and come up with a decision as far as what our stand is gonna be and how we're gonna communicate or not about where we stand with all of that that just passed. It put pressure. It put pressure on individual Christians, and it put pressure on Christian establishments, whether that's a Bible college or a Christian institution or a church. Why? Because we're now in a negative world. In other words, you are not incentivized to be posting scripture verses and so forth, especially if your boss or the person you want to hire you is going to visit your, your social media page before they decide to hire you. And like, ah, this person is too crazy about Jesus. We'll give, that's a hard pass. And so what happens is a lot in this world from 2014 to the present, more and more Christians are feeling the need to go private about what they believe and who they are, right? Because the days are becoming more and more negative, he says, but evil. Which is why Christians are having to realize we need to bring a whole nother strategy and a whole nother approach to being salt and light in this kind of world. The way we're gonna redeem the time is gonna have to look different in our day and age. You see that? We can't continue to do things as we once did because we're not going to be able to continue to advance God's kingdom. This is the world that you inherited, millennials, Gen Z, and you and I are gonna need to be prayerfully thinking about how are we gonna be gospel witnesses and how are we going to be kingdom men and women today, 
not in Billy Graham's world, but in this world. And Paul not only offers words of wisdom to the church in Ephesus then and there, he offers words of wisdom to us here and now. Notice what he says here in verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So notice here, Paul says, a Spirit-filled believer is someone who sets out to know what the will of God is. Can we know God's will? Yes. Can God's will be found? Yes, he says here. Now, there's a difference between the, the secret will of God and the revealed will of God. And here, what Paul is saying here is, there is a will of God that can be known. And one of the ways that we know that will is by not being foolish. Right? Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. If you have a Bible, you can know what the will of the Lord is. Paul says in Romans in chapter 12, one is, we're not supposed to be conformed to the patterns of this world, but rather, we're supposed to be transformed through the renewing of the mind so that we might be able to know what the will of the Lord is. What is this will? Is this will um, where I'm supposed to go to college or what her name is or what color that car and the make and the model is? Or, I mean, because we don't find that in the scriptures. So what does God mean about his will? More than the kind of details that you and I are tempted to quickly go to, the will that God is talking about is, regardless of what those details are, there is a will that God wants us to know. And that is, how do I live in a manner that's pleasing to the Lord? What does obedience look like? How can I know that no matter what station in life I occupy, how can I be sure that I can honor God even in those situations? You know, one thing I've found about this idea of the will of the Lord, because it's a common question that comes up often, is the way to get to clarity on the school or the spouse or the job, all the other details of our life, is by being clear on what God has already said in his word. Too many Christians race to all of these other things that are not found in the Bible before they first make sure they're doing the things that are in the Bible. And I found that the more we major on what's already in the scriptures, all of a sudden we find the kind of clarity that we've been looking for but did not have on who it is that we're supposed to be proceeding forward with in a relationship or in a job or in school or whatever that particular area is. You see, Paul here wants them to know the will of the Lord. Why? Because that's what comes with a spirit-filled Christian. You see, one thing I love about this is oftentimes the spirit and the word are at odds with each other. Right? I go to the word church. Like, you go to that church, man, you're going to get the word. Like, they walk through that text. Like, that's, that's the Bible church. Well, no, I go, I go to the Holy Spirit church. This church, like, man, you go there, the Spirit is there. And I found that oftentimes what we end up doing is we do something that the Spirit or the Word never asked for. It's like, why are you pitting us against one another? We're not at odds with each other. We should be a Word and a Spirit church. We shouldn't have to have people at, at 10 a.m. go to that church for the Holy Spirit and then at 12 go to that church for the Word. No, no, no. If you're a legit church, you should be a church that honors both the Holy Spirit and the Word. I mean, after all, who wrote the book? I know Paul wrote it, but who wrote it? The Holy Spirit is the one who is ultimately the author of the book. And so to be truly spirit, there's no way that you could be truly spirit-filled and not know the Bible. I've never met somebody who is a spirit-filled Christian but doesn't spend time in the Bible. Nor have I met somebody who spends time in the Bible the way that God wants who's not spirit-filled. And so we're taking the mystery out of what it looks like and what it means to be a spirit-filled Christian. Number one, we saw there that we lead a guarded life. We saw that. Number two, we realize that 
The days are evil, and so we want to lead productive lives because we can't just lead any old way. And three here, what we see here about being a spirit-filled Christian is that we care to know and to live in accordance with the will of the Lord. Not my will, because there is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof is what? It's death. It's death. So we don't want to live according to our own will. We want to live according to God's will. And if I'm going to want to be submitted to God's Holy Spirit, then I'm going to need to be submitted to his word. This is important because I've seen in circles where the Bible's like, that's dry, and it's like, that's just what you have to do. If you have the Holy Spirit, you really don't need the Bible. That's dangerous. You never want to pit the Holy Spirit up and against the word of God. Paul goes on, verse 18. He says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So the other mark that Paul says comes with being filled with the Spirit is we're not filled with all sorts of other stuff. <laughs> That's what he's saying. In the context, he brings up alcohol. But please, by all means, do not limit what Paul is trying to say to just alcohol. It just happens to be the thing that's dominant in that environment, right? It's, it's, it's at all the parties, it's at all the occasions, and he realizes that it's got a hold on people. And if you don't get that under control, all sorts of other things are going to be a mess. But in our day and age, if it's not the bottle, it could be any number of things. And so to be feel, spirit-filled means to not be filled with all sorts of other stuff. Sometimes we pray, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit, and we sing all the songs about the Holy Spirit, but we haven't done anything about what currently fills us. And so if we want him in us, then we got to get all sorts of other stuff that compete with him out of us, okay? More than you and I having more of the Holy Spirit, the question really is, does the Holy Spirit have more of us? He, he uses this word, look with me, he says, don't get drunk with wine, for this is debauchery. The word there for debauchery is indulgence. It's overindulgence. It could be related to alcohol, it could be drugs, it could be any number of things, but basically, it's a lot, it's too much, it's overboard. And what he's saying here is a, a life that is given over to drunkenness is a life that will not know anything about what it looks like to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. What is it about drunkenness? Well, when you get drunk, you are coming under the power of another substance. You are surrendering. It's a depressant. And what do depressants do? They depress your mechanisms like self-control. And so what happens is you, you are coming under the control and the power of another substance. That's what it means to be drunk. You are no longer in the driver's seat. Something else has, I think you have say, but something else has say. And now every other thing is inevitable now that you're drunk. Paul looks at that and he says, you know what? Not only do I not want you to be drunk, but that's actually what the Christian life is all about. Instead of coming under the power and the control of that substance, come under the power and the control of the Holy Spirit. See that? The Holy Spirit is not a depressant. The Holy Spirit is a stimulant. He stimulates us to love and good works. He stimulates up us to righteousness and holiness. He stimulates us to live and to serve and to do the will of our, our Lord. He stimulates us. The, the bottle depresses the very things that we need to be able to survive in our day and age. But the Holy Spirit stimulates us to be able to serve and to live and to do the will of, of God. So instead of being drunk with wine, what should we be? We should be filled. We should be filled with the Spirit. Now, in the Greek, this is important. There, the Greek is be constantly being filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come up in the English. It's a present, active, continuous. So what this means is, there are some people who, all they got to their name is some point in time at some conference. 
some retreat, some event where they just remember one point in time where they decided to ask the Holy Spirit to fill them. It was a one and done. It was a one-time event. And then after that, they never made any point to want to continue to go to the Holy Spirit to receive fresh presence, fresh power, fresh strength. In other words, they relied upon him one time in their life, but every other time in their life, they were the ones in control. Paul says here, be filled with the Spirit. Literally, be being filled with the Spirit. There's never a time where we should not be constantly coming to him again. But I came to him already. All right, come to him again. <laughs> but I did that yesterday. <laughs> do it today. But I thought we did that last week. Yeah, we're going to do it this week. <laughs> but that's how I started my morning. End your night that way. <laughs> okay? It's like, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, maybe this is just me and you could just listen in, but I found that as a Christian, I've, even though God fills me, I'm a leaky bucket. You ever have one of those buckets? You go to the fountain and you, you end up filling it up and all of a sudden you make your way to wherever it is you came from. And if you just look back, just, just for a moment, you'll notice already you got a trail behind you. And by the time you get to your destination, it's kind of getting lighter. <laughs> and oftentimes that's how we are as Christians, is we go to God and he fills us up, but before you know it, we walk out of service, we hit the parking lot, we make it out to a dinner, a meal, an outing, we start our, our week, and all of a sudden, it's kind of getting light. It's like, what's going on here? We're leaky buckets. Sometimes it's bitterness, lack of gratitude. Uh, maybe it's just a failure to realize who we are, uh, our identity. It's one struggle, one challenge, one temptation. It's life. There's all sorts of stuff that's coming at us that explains why my bucket is leaking, which is why I need to keep coming to him. The old hymn didn't say, I need thee once. I need thee every hour. Every hour I need thee. Paul says here, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be being filled with the Spirit. Notice here, additionally, verse 19, the other mark of the Holy Spirit is God puts a song in your heart. God puts a song in your heart. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, what's interesting in here is you probably noticed that. It, why the categories? Because God is trying to show that there's variety. I think it's important for us. Notice he, he, call, he says psalms, uh, the early church in Jesus, the songs that they sang were the psalms. So they would take the psalms and they would put it to metric note and they would sing them. Uh, in fact, there are certain churches, if you were to ever visit them, if you ever wanted to, the only songs that they sing are psalms. I don't know if you've ever been in these kind of churches. That's all they sing. No new songs, nothing. Not, not even hymns. They just sing the psalms. They really are taking, they just forgot some of the other uh, category. <laughs> just keep reading, keep reading, right? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So what that shows us here is that God is saying that there should be diversity in a variety of songs that should come out of the tradition of the church. There's a proverb that talks about the wise man takes out of his, from his treasure both old and new. Right? I, that's what I pray for for our church is that we wouldn't be a church that's just simply singing new songs that are just five months old, but that we also can sing songs that are dated and that represent maybe not just our journey, but perhaps our parents and so forth. You see, because a church in time is a church that's going to be a multi-generational church. And songs have a way of bringing nostalgia, and songs have a way of locating God and his dealings in our life and the things that he's done. It's not just the song that you sing. It takes you back to a particular time. And when you're able to have a diversity of songs, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, you're able to connect with a, with, with a wider band of God's people who represent not just the current generation, but also the previous generations. And together, we're able to appreciate that God has been God, not just to us, but to all of us. And this is important. We need, we, need, we need all the songs that we can get. It's not about whether, there's nothing pure, necessarily holy and righteous about singing songs that are 100 plus years old. 
And there's nothing necessarily holy or righteous about singing songs that are only five years old. I think what we see here is, the Psalms say, sing a new song to the Lord. We, we want to be people who make sure that the songs that we sing are psalms and, and hymns and, and spiritual songs to the Lord. But notice what Paul says here. Making melody to the Lord where? In your heart. So even if you uh, can't hold the note, the Lord is looking out for you in your heart. Just make melody in your heart. Some of us, we need to, hey, I hear you. Just make that melody in your heart, okay? Right there, in your heart. I, I see you. They don't need to hear you. I hear you. That's what the Lord is saying. Who said that the Lord doesn't have humor? The Lord has humor. Verse 20, giving thanks. This is that season we're in right now in our lives. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know the other mark of a spirit-filled life? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. What does this mean, Thanksgiving? Well, a thankful heart. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the people and, and the things that you've done. Thank you for your hand and your presence in my life. You see, a spirit-filled Christian doesn't have to look hard and doesn't have to look far to know how to be thankful to the Lord. To be a complainer and a grumbler and a Christian is an oxymoron. One thing that should not mark our lives as believers is a life full of complaint. A life full of grumbling and murmuring and bitterness. Of all people, you and I should be the ones who are thankful. We should, we should be men and women who are full of, of gratitude. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, in everything, give thanks to the Lord. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything. Literally, in some versions, in all circumstances. Which means, I don't even have to wait for a particular circumstance or situation. It's like, I, I want to be thankful. I'm just waiting for a time to be thankful. No, 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 no. No, no. In all circumstances, give thanks. Christians are never invited to be thankful for the thing in and of itself, but we are invited to be thankful to God for what he's doing with it. So maybe you're here today and it's kind of hard to receive that part because of what's going on in your life right now. God's not necessarily saying, hey, come on, suck it up. Look at that thing all over again and just be thankful for it. No, no, no. What he's saying is, do you recognize I'm sovereign? Do you recognize I'm good? Do you see me as a father who, who loves you and, and cares for you and desires to provide for you and, and be together for good for those who love God and are the called according to his purpose? God never invites us to call the thing itself good, but he does invite us to call the fact that he's working all things for our good. He says there, give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And lastly, I want you to look with me here. A spirit-filled Christian is a submitted Christian, is a submitted Christian. He says here, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Not out of reverence or fear of man, but out of reverence and fear of God. Uh, submission is, is something that should mark all of the Christian life. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. If we're civic, the Bible talks about if we're citizens, we, we submit to the powers that be that are ordained of God, right? If, if we're Christians, we submit to one another. If there's leadership within the church, we submit to the leadership. If we have a job, we, as employees, we submit to our employers. If we're children, we submit to our parents. And here, Paul says, as believers in community... We're called to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Don't go off and try to do your own thing because when you become a Christian, you're a spirit-filled Christian. 
And as a spirit-filled Christian, what you learn is when you join the church, the sport that you're joining is a team sport. This isn't a solo sport. It's a team sport. So when he says submit to one another, we're joining a team sport. And there's a certain kind of a attitude and a approach that you bring to a team that's a team sport. And Paul says, if we're going to do this thing right, then we're going to need to understand this is what it means to be a spirit-filled Christian. Maybe you're here today. And this is an opportunity because I want to pray for us. And you say, you know what? I've, I, I feel like I've been running on my own steam. I've sort of paid mental assent to the Holy Spirit. I mean, after all, it's in the book. I can't deny it. But if, if the truth be told, man, I, I feel like I've been living from another place. And I realize right now, this is an invitation and it's a command. You notice when he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. In the text, what Paul is saying is, ask. You say, oh, I've never been filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, ask, and you'll receive. Knock, and the door will be open. Seek, and you will find. If your fathers, being evil, know how to give you good gifts when you ask, how much more, Jesus says, will your father give you, watch this, the Holy Spirit? The father wants to give you the Holy Spirit. Here, if we're being filled with the Holy Spirit, God wants to give you the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit again and again and again. You and I cannot ask him enough. When we look at what the Christian life entails and what the, God, the call of God on our life is, there's no way in the world that you and I could attempt to live this Christian life apart from the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what I want to do, because I believe there's no better thing we could do right now, is to invite us to a time where as we pray, we're going to go to God himself. And we're going to say, God, Holy Spirit, you're not a force, you're not an it, you're not a thing, you're a person, and you're here today. And you invite me to welcome you all over again. God the Holy Spirit will fill you. He'll fill you with more and more of his presence, and he'll fill you with more and more of his power so that you can go and do the things that God has called you to do. Amen? This is not by might. This is not by power. This is by my spirit. Let's stand together if we can pray together in this time. Where you are, if it helps, I'm going to take my hands and you could join me. And uh, old saints used to put the palms up as a way of receiving. It's nothing magical or anything about this. It's just an opportunity for us to posture ourselves. Sometimes when we put ourselves in, the, in, in that physical place, it kind of re-communicates for us what's happening in the moment, right? Maybe you're here today and you come from a context where it's like, oh man, if there's any mention made of the Holy Spirit, I, I, I kind of get scared. I can't get, you don't have to, okay? If you want to welcome the Holy Spirit into your life. You want to understand that he wants you to, these days are evil. It's crazy out there, y'all. There's no way in the world that we can lead the kind of lives that God calls us to in these evil days apart from the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. We need him more than ever. And he's prepared here and today to fill us afresh. We're gonna do this together, but my plea for us is after you leave this place, Maybe even while you're driving to wherever it is you have to get to. Or perhaps after you arrive at your destination, do it again. Okay? Do it again. When you get home in the evening and so forth and you're preparing to wind down, you just end it and call it quits for the night, do it again. When you wake up 
in the morning when you prepare yourself for your new week. And before you rush out, and get after it and do it again. And even as you are busy about your day, throughout the course of the day, do it again. The Bible says, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Father, we come before you thanking you that you are the giver of good gifts. We come to this moment, Lord God, acknowledging our need for the Holy Spirit. We can't do marriage without the Holy Spirit. We can't do community without the Holy Spirit. We can't do ministry without the Holy Spirit. We can't do life without the Holy Spirit. Jesus, you said, I am the true vine, and you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same, shall bear much. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I pray, Lord God, that if we weren't convinced when we walked in, that we would be convinced right here and right now, that there's no way in the world we can pull this thing off called Christianity apart from being filled with your Holy Spirit. And so, Holy Spirit, we come to you now. Oh, God, fill us with everything you've got. Fill us afresh. May you have more and more of us. I pray that we not just surrender a part of us over to you, but that we surrender our lives into your hands. Do with us as you please. Have your way. Speak, teach us, guide us, help us, comfort us, correct us, convict us, encourage us, admonish us. Reveal to us your ways and your will. Help us to know how to look carefully how we ought to be walking. Some of us were clueless. I remember I was clueless. I didn't know my left hand from my right. Teach us, show us is that what is pleasing to the Lord and what's not pleasing to the Lord. Help us to not go the way of the fool, but help us to be wise men and women in our day and age. Father God, we thank you that we don't have to any longer be given over to drunkenness, but rather we're going to be given over to being filled with your Holy Spirit. Father God, I pray that we not be in the dark when it comes to the will of the Lord, but that we walk in the light. Thank you that your word is in our hearts. God, I pray over this church and this congregation right now, even as we pray. Lord God, for those who are in need of more and more of you, fill them right now in Jesus' name. Father God, whatever has, has capped them off, whatever has served as a bottleneck, whatever has prevented you, Holy Spirit, from being able to have access to them, Lord God, I pray, unclog the pipes. And may there be a fresh wind of your Holy Spirit that blows through this place. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that he is the one who enables us to, to live in a way that is pleasing to you. Holy Spirit, commission your church. Empower your church for ministry as we seek to be available to you. Thank you for this time of ours. Thank you for honoring your word and for allowing us to know what it looks like to be men and women who are filled with your Holy Spirit. God, we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God praise. Let's give God praise.